Uh, good morning. My name is Mark Goldberg. I'm a hematologist oncologist on the faculty at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. I'm a longtime volunteer with the American Cancer Society, past chair of the Eastern New England Board, and a, a member of the National Board of Directors of the American Cancer Society. Uh, together with my colleague, Gary Lipheimer, who's on this call, who's an American Cancer Society Vice President for Cancer Control for the Northeast United States, allow me to welcome you to the 2020 meeting of the American Cancer Society Eastern New England Council of Advisors. I hope you're all well during these turbulent times. And of course, it's impossible to meet in person. Um, so thank you for taking the time from your busy schedules to attend the Zoom meeting. Because we felt three hours on Zoom is a bit long, we've cut the meeting to two hours. So in the interest of time management, and because of the size of the group, uh, I'm gonna forego the usual round of introducing ourselves. Most of you know one another already and have been serving on the council for a few years. Uh, additionally, uh, the complete list, uh, invitee list, uh, including many guests, was sent to all of you on September 29th as part of the pre-read materials. However, I, I did want to uh, take a moment to welcome and introduce a few new members. Uh, Dr. David Avigan, who's Chief of Hematology and Hematologic Malignancies at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, is replacing Dr. Pierre Polo Pandolfi, who's left the BI. Mr. Leon Bethune, he's the Director of Community Initiatives Bureau at the Boston Public Health Commission, and he's taking over uh, for Monica Valdez Lupi, who's left the commission. Dr. Catherine Dallow, who's Vice President of Clinical Programs and Strategy at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, is replacing uh, Dr. Bruce Nash. Uh, Ms. Ruth Blodgett, Director of Community Health and Prevention in the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, is representing the Commissioner, uh, Dr. Monica Burrell, who couldn't be with us today. Uh, Dr. Farah. Shafe is the interim chief medical officer at Always Health Partners and is replacing Mr. David Siegel, the former CEO who, who has left that organization. Uh, Dr. Rachel Buxbaum is the director of the Tufts Cancer Center and chief of the division of hematology oncology at Tufts Medical Center. Uh, Rachel is replacing Dr. Jack Urban, who recently passed away. And Rachel, I, I know Jack was a beloved physician, teacher, mentor and friend to so many people, not only in the Tufts community, but well beyond, and it'll be greatly missed. Finally, I would also like to extend a welcome to Dr. Bill Kantz, who's the new Chief Medical and Scientific Officer for the American Cancer Society, who's participating today. Few housekeeping notes. Uh, the meeting is being recorded and it'll be available to, to all who wish a copy. Uh, additionally, a copy of all the slides uh, will be sent immediately following this meeting, along with a brief meeting evaluation form, so we'd greatly appreciate it if you can complete and return it. Uh, please mute your connections when not speaking, and to minimize confusion, if you have any questions or comments, please try to use the hand raising function, which is in, uh, if you go to uh, participants at the bottom, there is a, a way of raising your hand, or you can just use the chat function. We'll be monitoring that on the Zoom. Uh, we'll be monitoring that throughout. Um, however, if we don't see you, um, please feel free to speak up. You'll have to remember to unmute yourself. Uh, next slide, please. So allow me to briefly review today's agenda. I'll briefly review the, the purpose and goals of the council. We'll then spend the remainder of the time learning about the work of the Boston Breast Cancer Equity Coalition, and more specifically, the exciting work being done by the Translating Research into Practice, or TRIP Consortium. The TRIP team will focus the discussion around three challenges that they're working hard to address, and we're hopeful that we might be able to help them address them. Uh, we'll hear more about those in a moment. We plan to divide the time pretty equally between presentations and discussions, so we hope this session will be very interactive. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, to briefly review, the, the mission of the American Cancer Society succinctly is to save lives, celebrate lives, and lead the fight for a world without cancer. 
Uh, the society has set a very ambitious goal to reduce age-adjusted cancer mortality by 40% by 2035. But everything we do to reach that goal is viewed through the filter uh, that is comprised of, of three things, a, a focus on patients, working as a convener to bring like-minded organizations and institutions together in collaboration to move the mission forward like we're doing today, and very importantly, through a health equity lens. Uh, next slide, please. To be clear, from a cancer perspective, we define health equity as everyone having the right to a fair and just opportunity to prevent, find, treat, and survive cancer. Everyone. Next slide, please. This brings us to the Eastern New England Council of Advisors. In 2018, we formed the Council of Advisors to bring together uh, senior healthcare leaders in academia, in industry, in government, to provide advice and guidance to the American Cancer Society to help advance the mission. As you know, we convene the group annually to focus on uh, an important cancer-related issue. The goal is to leverage the expertise of the council members to advise the, the society and to champion efforts within their industry and within their spheres of influence to enhance collaboration and be a catalyst for new connections and synergies. Uh, next slide. The focus of our inaugural meeting held in October of 2018 was on strategies and tactics to increase HPV vaccination rates in Massachusetts. Our, our second meeting in October of 2019 focused on increasing colorectal cancer screening in Massachusetts with the goal of achieving 80% screening compliance in every community. And I might add, we're doing quite well in, in, in Eastern New England compared to the rest of the country, but we still have more to do in those areas. Right after our October 2019 meeting, Gary Lipheimer and I started brainstorming about the topic for this year's meeting. We wanted to be sure that it was important and, and central to achieving the goals of the American Cancer Society. We pretty quickly honed in on the topic of identifying the social determinants of health. However, while we felt this was a critically important issue, we, we felt that the topic had the potential to be too amorphous and unfocused if we didn't structure the agenda effectively. So as we continue to ponder about how we might put such a program together, I happened to meet with an old friend and fellow American Cancer Society uh, leadership volunteer, Dr. Tracy Battaglia, who's Associate Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology at the Boston University Schools of Medicine and Public Health where she serves as the director of the Women's Health Unit. And as she shared with me the nature of the work uh, on achieving health equity in breast cancer outcomes right here in Boston, uh, including the progress they made and the challenges that they have encountered, it seemed like an ideal project to present to this council to allow us uh, to move from an abstract discussion to a real world experience and trying to identify and address the social determinants of health as they pertain to breast cancer outcomes. Uh, next slide, please. So with that brief background, our goals for today are to increase your awareness and understanding of current partnerships, research, and work happening to impact equity in breast cancer outcomes here in the greater Boston area. And then to leverage the expertise and influence of the council members and the invited guests to help address these challenges that have been identified and to champion uh, improvement efforts within your spheres of influence. We, we hope we're going to be able to enhance collaboration and be a catalyst for new connections and synergies. I, I think you'll see that this work that the team is doing is incredibly important and I hope together we'll be able to assist them in realizing their ultimate goal of achieving health equity in breast cancer outcomes. Next slide, please. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tracy Battaglia um, to begin our program. Tracy. Thank you so much, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to start by saying hello to old friends and colleagues. It's great to see so many familiar faces, um, but there certainly are many of you who I have not had the pleasure of meeting. So we're really thrilled to be able to have the opportunity to talk with you about our work. 
Um, really grateful to Mark and Gary for um, having the wisdom to bring such a project to this group. Um, I want to acknowledge first that this work was actually presented about two years ago uh, when we were just kicking off at the ACS uh, Research Breakfast in June 2018. And boy, what a different world we're living in now. Um, uh, I think COVID really, for all of us, had really laid bare the systemic oppression that's at the root of inequality in this country. And it really makes the work of the TRIP Consortium more important than ever. So I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity two years later to share with this group the lessons that we're learning as we're trying to implement this work. It's not easy and it definitely takes an army. And so we're, we're privileged to have the opportunity to speak with you about it today. Um, I'm just gonna get us started by introducing the group. This is gonna be a true team effort in our presentation today. So I'm gonna start just by highlighting the lead investigators for the TRIP Consortium. Um, in the spirit of true community engaged science, this is a multiple PI project, which means that it's led by um, several um, key investigators. So myself here at Boston Medical Center, my colleague Jennifer Haas at Mass General, Karen Freund from Tufts Medical Center, and Stephanie Lemon from UMass Medical Center. Each of us brings um, a lens of healthcare disparities research with different levels of expertise um, and different populations that we've worked with. Uh, we couldn't do this without our junior faculty colleagues, Amy LeClaire, Cheryl Clark, and Christine Gunn. And of, as you'll hear, the real sort of um, drive for this work came from the community. Um, and that's why we're so proud of the work that we're doing because it really is a true, true community driven project. And so I'm thrilled to have Sharon Bach and Rachel Friedman, who are the co-chairs of the Boston Breast Cancer Equity Coalition, here to share with you kind of the story of the inception of TRIP. Um, Sharon Burns-White, who you're all familiar with, um, is a strong colleague on the coalition and one of our advisors on our steering committee. There's too many other people to list on this slide. I want to acknowledge that um, we have a great group of key stakeholders um, from clinical providers and navigators to uh, research associates and staff um, that make this work possible. Next slide. So this is just an overview of what we're going to talk about for the next couple of hours. As Mark said, we want this to be an interactive. We'll do a little bit of didactic presentation and then each of these sessions has a set of um, discussion questions we'd love to explore with you together. Uh, we're going to start um, with a discussion of the Boston Breast Cancer Equity Coalition. Um, Rachel Friedman and um, Sharon Bach, um, as I said, our co-directors of that coalition are going to lead that off. And then we'll have a discussion about the coalition itself. <laughs> then I'll introduce, with my dog behind me, um, our project, Translating Research into pra Practice. Let you know sort of where we are two years into it. Have a little discussion about that, see if there's any questions about the science and the project. And then we're going to launch into um, the challenges that we're faced and really hopefully spend the majority of our time together discussing challenges around implementing uh, um, interventions in a health system, um, data sharing challenges that we have across the city, and then of course really focusing on identifying and responding to the social needs of our target population. These challenges are not going to sound new to you. They're going to be old and familiar. And I think the notion that we're coming together as a collaborative across the city um, with some really um, smart minds and passionate, um, committed people, and we're still not able to overcome some of those challenges is exactly why we're here today, to hear from you, to see how we, you can assist us in getting to where we want to be, which is um, equity in breast cancer outcomes for all. Um, so with that, the next slide. I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Rachel Friedman, to talk with us about the evolution of the Boston Breast Cancer Equity Coalition. Good morning, Rachel. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Okay. Hopefully. Yes, good. Good morning. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this presentation and discussion. I'm really honored to be a part of this group. I am Rachel Friedman. I'm a medical oncologist specializing in breast cancer at Dana-Farber. And I'm really delighted to work with this amazing group of people as we work towards our mission and vision to equalize outcomes for all women in the city of Boston who have breast cancer. 
I'm here, as you heard, along with Sharon Bach, but there are many other members of the BBCEC who I see on this call, and it's hard to acknowledge everybody, but many of them were founding members, and I just want to acknowledge, I know I saw Karen Burns-White and Anne Levine, Erica Warner. Um, it's hard for me to see everybody as I'm talking, but I just want to acknowledge that this coalition is a huge effort by many people, and if anyone has any comments along the way, feel free to chime in. Um, but I'm happy to be here today to tell you a little bit about how the Boston Breast Cancer um, Equity Coalition was started and what we're trying to do. Next slide, please. So although disparities in breast cancer outcomes or mortality have been well described for years, there was a very sobering article published in I think 2014, which highlighted the black white disparities in mortality for women with breast cancer in 50 US cities over two periods of time, looking at trends in mortality for black women versus white women. And unfortunately, 35 of those cities showed an increase in mortality in those two time periods. And also, unfortunately, Boston was the fifth highest or fifth worst when it came to mortality, with a large excess of black deaths overall and uh, for, with women dying from breast cancer. Next slide. This article sparked an immediate response, and I think it was really disheartening to see how local these disparities were. I think we're all aware of it on national levels, but when you see it in your own city, I, we all uh, start to get upset, especially with many of us who are involved in work um, with regard to disparities. And I'm really proud of how we came together for the first time ever really across the city to address this problem on a local level. And through word of mouth and our connections and our sort of homegrown uh, ways of coming together, we started the Boston Breast Cancer Equity Coalition. And this really was in direct response to these local disparities. And we brought together multidisciplinary stakeholders from nonprofit organizations, government agencies in the city, including the Cancer Registry, um, institutions and providers across the city, patients, survivors, advocates, policymakers, and researchers. And we really came together for the mission to develop citywide solutions, uh, putting our institutions aside um, with the aim of eliminating inequities in breast cancer outcomes. And so we've grown and the member organizations are here and over time, you know, we've added um, organizations that make sense, including advocacy organizations, leaders in the city who are interested in this topic and want to make a difference. And we are still growing and trying to uh, find our way, trying to get great representation from people across the city. But of course, American Cancer Society has really been there from the beginning with representatives joining our meetings regularly, um, advocacy groups like Asian Women for Health, all of the major uh, medical centers in the city of Boston who provide cancer care for the majority of patients with breast cancer. And we had a lot of um, uh, response from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, we have the cancer, the tumor registry for Massachusetts who's been able to provide uh, data for us on a local level and contribute significantly to the discussions. And we really are trying to promote evidence-based practices and policy. And as we've come together, it's provided this opportunity for projects like TRIP, where we have this natural collaboration that's developed, where people are really passionate about this work, and it allows for really amazing cross-city collaborations um, and for, from people who are truly invested in this work. Next slide. So when we saw that article, we said, okay, is this for real? And we asked uh, Susan Gershman from our tumor registry to look um, at the registry numbers and to really confirm that what we saw in that hunt paper was actually true. And unfortunately, we confirmed that in fact, we do see a lot of disparities locally in our own city among residents of Boston, showing here that the mortality for black women in Boston is the highest, um, followed by white women, Asian and Latina women. And so I think this allowed us to really confirm and use this as a starting point as we work to improve this and um, as a foundation of the work that we're trying to do. Next slide. And so one thing that we also found, um, mentioning that we're data driven, is we actually looked pretty carefully at what is going on in the city that might be contributing to these disparities. 
And one thing that is always raised is screening and rates of advanced stage disease at presentation. And one thing that is unique in the city of Boston is our rates of mammography are extremely high. And if you look at black women in Boston, about 90% of them are getting their mammograms pretty regularly. And so with that, we also looked at the numbers of patients who present with metastatic disease, and it's about the same across groups. And so we pretty quickly, although we wanna pay attention to screening and especially in the world of COVID screening, I'm sure is falling off as women are, are, are not engaging in their care, but we really decided to focus more on the treatment aspects because we did think that there were many programs in the city that were promoting screening. We still want that to be a part of our work, but I think thinking about what's really causing the disparities in our city, we were all worried that it was a treatment problem. And so we looked at the data in the city of Boston and saw that treatment delays are real. And for patients who are black and non-Hispanic, or have Medicaid, the delays to care for breast cancer once a diagnosis are made are two times more likely for black women and almost three times more likely for patients uh, insured by Medicaid. These are local data. Um, this is happening all around us. Um, and so I think this is a great setup for the work that TRIP is trying to do because this has been a focus of the TRIP award in trying to get into those treatments for those patients and improve the time to getting to the care they need. Next slide. So um, as part of this work unrelated to the BBCEC is the Community Health Needs Assessment or the CHINA. Um, and there may be people on this call who are very involved in this, so feel free to correct me on anything I say. Um, but this is a community health assessment and community health um, implementation process. And every three years to gain a greater understanding of the health needs of our patients in Boston with cancer, not just specific to breast cancer, there is a big analysis that gets done, which includes key informant interviews, a large community survey of Boston residents and the use or availability of secondary data and reviewing that. And the CHINA was recently completed last year and has been publicly available for all of you to review. But some of the challenges to treatments that were brought out by the CHINA um, with regard to cancer care were a lack of care coordination, the high cost of treatment, maintaining employment during a diagnosis, transportation challenges, child care challenges, language barriers, a lack of cultural competency for the people taking care of patients with cancer, institutional racism, and a lack of clinical trial opportunities. And so this really is a setup for the city uh, to set the stage for the areas that we really need to focus on. So we have delays in care, and then we have all this other stuff that's in the patient's lives that are getting in the way uh, of their cancer care and perhaps contributing to delay. Next slide. And so Boston, unfortunately, has an environment that promotes unequal challenges to accessing care. We have a lot of healthcare systems, and so our access should be excellent, um, but it's a complicated system, um, and the challenges accessing care are unequally borne. And if you just look at the household median net worth, um, according to data from 2015, it is astounding the differences in income here. And in fact, I said to Sharon last night, are you sure $8 is in a typo? And she very quickly sent me the Boston Globe article that in fact, it says literally in the title, this is not a typo. Um, they actually have really low median net worth. It's astounding to me the differences here. And I mean, how can you achieve equality in anything if you're starting with this? Um, Boston is also the third most gentrified city. It's expensive to live here. It's difficult to live here. And the transfers between systems can really complicate delays and patients will often fall off at one medical center, show up at another, time will pass, and there's really no communication between these medical centers of how to pick up and know that that patient was lost to care and where they showed up. We have different medical records and it's really difficult to make sure that patients aren't lost. Next slide. And so many of you have probably seen this, um, this uh, slide before, which is sort of the layering um, context of care that promotes disparities, unfortunately. We have, of course, our nas national health policy environment, then the state level environments, the communities, 
the organizations, the providers, the family and supports, and then we get down to the individual patient. So you can see that all of these layers will affect a woman's ability to get the care that she needs and to do as well as she can. And if you have barriers on any of these levels, you are at risk to get patients in trouble uh, when they're trying to achieve uh, their best outcome they can with breast cancer and really any, any uh, health condition. And so our approach to addressing disparities is really to think about multiple levels of layered care and to coordinate across these layers of care in a better way. How can we think about coordinating between health systems and departments and our community partners and our payers and our policymakers? This really needs to be done at a local level. Um, trying to address disparities as a nation is a really difficult thing. Every city and, and town has its own challenges that need to be addressed on a local level. Really can't be an institutional approach. We need to come together to do this. And we really need to engage our community partners because that's what we're all trying uh, to achieve is, is, is in the community. <laughs> can't do it without them. So with that, um, I guess we can pause and think about some of our discussion topics. And I'm going to hand it over to Sharon to lead us through this part of it. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you and answering any questions you have about the BBCEC. Thanks, Rachel. That was a great overview of what the, of the lay of the land of breast cancer in Boston. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sharon Bach. I co-chair the coalition with Rachel Friedman. I'm excited to be here. Um, and so I just want to pause before we go into the details of TRIP. And since we have uh, such a great group of folks at the table, based on your respective roles in oncology right now, what are your thoughts um, or suggestions about, about our approach? Do you have suggestions about what we should be looking at? Um, what our next trip grant, granted you don't know about the details of trip, but what's the next steps we should be doing? And one thing to just, uh, and I meant to sort of talk about this before we launch in, but the BBCEC, we've been evolving in how we're organized and how we're trying to implement some of the work we're trying to do. And so what we've done is try to develop working groups and we have a community engagement working group. We have a health policy working group. We have a care working group. And what we're really trying to do with our strategic plan is to develop tangible things that we can achieve um, in our city in these different spheres. And so, um, you know, we are, we were a little bit derailed in our strategic plan because of COVID as we were literally trying to roll out this exciting strategic plan, everything really changed. Um, and our ability to get into clinics and be with our community partners in person is just not possible. And so we've had to reframe a lot of what we're doing and rethink how we can best uh, do this in the you know, era of our pandemic. So just to set that sort of the community. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a very good point. All of our strategies and our uh, plan really include some collaboration with stakeholders such as this group here at this table today. And um, <clears throat> the pandemic has really you know, changed clinical services and breast care and women uh, on top of that are being pulled in very different directions, right? So breast cancer care, uh, screening and treatment may not be at the top of their list right now. As you know, they experience the higher unemployment, the burden of childcare and other, other stressors. So are there programs at your organizations that could help support women returning to care? Uh, either at screening, treatment, or survivorship. We've heard from our patients in the coalition that uh, folks are reluctant to return to care, which would further um, exacerbate this disparity in Boston. And so we'd really like to prevent that. Um, and I know that there are uh, certain uh, offerings by the Boston Public Health Commission in terms of transportation and the, the van, uh, are there opportunities at your organization to help support patients into care that the BBCEC could then promote? 
I'm going to stop talking. Welcome people to comment. Uh, if you click on the participants uh, button on the bottom of the Zoom toolbar, uh, on the right-hand side at the bottom, you should see uh, a hand raising function. But if you're not being recognized, just please feel, feel free to speak up. Hi, Mark. This is Manny. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, this was great information. I was surprised that uh, there aren't any community health centers as uh, members of the coalition. Um, and when we talk about uh, delivering services within the community, uh, could you speak to a little bit of um, any reasons why? And I know you said screening is high, but I'm not sure how many health centers actually have do mammography screenings on site um, beyond the van actually having programs on site. So two questions. Um, membership within the coalition and the second question uh, is there value of health centers having um, mammography screening on site um, and hence developing a more broader program um, to allow for uh, treatment hi manny those are really great questions and yes um, as i mentioned our and it's rachel mentioned our strategic plan was derailed in january or march just when the pandemic hit and one of the strategies proposed was actually collaborating with community health centers. It was an oversight. We realized we hadn't had representation. And so this gives us a great opportunity to connect with folks like you. Um, and in terms of screening at community health centers, um, I think that would be a long term goal. I think right now we need to do some outreach in terms of education. And there we are supporting a webinar at the end of this month to um, have a conversation and have representation from Boston Public Health Committee and some CBOs we work with. If you could help us disseminate that webinar access so that we can get more women to join and answer questions um, and participate in that webinar, that would be fabulous. Uh, but we would love to have community health centers at the table and help us think about strategies to get women into screening and to get them the treatment they need. And just to build on that, we have had community center representation. Um, I think it just hasn't been that coordinated and centralized. And that, as Sharon said, was really a priority uh, for this coming year. And we are with you on that 100%. Um, with regard to the screening, um, you know, the Whittier Street Health Center has, an, has a screening uh, unit inside the building. And with the mammography van, actually, um, it, it goes to all the major health centers and the prisons in the city and does a really amazing job um, at screening. Unfortunately, right now, because of the pandemic, things are limited, of course, but uh, on a day to day basis, the mammal van is traveling around the city and trying to access um, health centers to get women screened. And it's red. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the mammography van, but it is um, the radiologists on the van are Brigham and Women's breast imagers who review uh, cases and then bring people for diagnostic imaging to Brigham or wherever they need to be in coordination with their primary team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a device here in East Boston as well um, that's on site. But I'm thinking about the, um, the care navigation that goes along with that screening. Uh, and the follow-up care um, and in any one of these circumstances we found that extremely valuable to have someone who speaks the language knows the culture um, and can develop the relationship with the patient and follow care treatment if necessary um, do you currently have patient navigation services for breast health at um, east boston Muni? we do um, i'm not sure who's actually running that function right now but we mm -hmm. had for a long time uh, dedicated and we found significant um, you know adherence to follow-up care and usually at BMC or MGH uh, I know Tracy just spoke uh, so she sees a lot of our patients uh, from East Boston um, so again it's in, in any condition that's always been um, I think the, uh, the solution for making sure people can um, continue to receive the care that they need, the care navigators or community health workers, um, you know, are valuable to the process. I think, I think the challenge has been maintaining funding for those which are often research-based. 
Mm -hmm. So with Tracy and Karen and, and I worked on PNRP, uh, Patient Navigation Research Program, for which East Boston was a site, uh, several of the community health centers uh, were sites. But that funding goes away, right? And so how do you maintain um, navigation? And that would be, which is not reimbursable currently. Uh, I, try, I know Tracy's going to talk about this in a little bit. And we have two questions, uh, Pia. Good morning. Thank you for, for this um, wonderful presentation and for the history, you know, of the organization. Um, it's really, really, um, it's, it's really great. I, I just thought it would be worth mentioning. Um, uh, someone was saying that, um, you know, the, the situation that COVID has caused and sort of caused a shift in priorities, you know, for, um, for patients. Um, and I just wanted to say, and I think it's just foundational for us to remember this as we are looking for ways to change the data that we've, we're seeing, is that these priorities existed prior to COVID. Mm -hmm. It's not COVID that made this, you know, the, the, the reason, you know, for all of this. Um, and, and, and the issue around priority is that um, you, you mentioned about the median net wealth gap. And so I think that is a really important piece because many of uh, these patients, particularly the ones who are, um, you know, black and brown patients, they cannot prioritize health and healthcare because they're so they're, they're prioritizing survival. And so um, that's how they make their choices. And, um, you know, that's how they uh, decide what matters to them most. And by the way, I mean, I know it's, 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 it's crazy to think of this, but for many of these patients, you know, cancer is not the worst thing in their lives. And so to them. And so I think as we think about going forward, you know, what we can do to change the data, we have to really address the foundational root of what's causing the behavior um, for anything else to work. Other, otherwise, you know, um, we will just be doing something on a very cursory level and not giving ourselves the opportunity to achieve um, equity in this space and achieve at high, high rates. That's all I wanna say, but thank you. And, and thank you so much for the opportunity to even join the group today. I really, really um, appreciate it and I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Thea. Sharon, we have one more question. Uh, Michael? Oh, hi, thanks, Gary. Um, this is Mike Vasconcells. I'm one of the members of the ACS Eastern New England Board. And um, it was really a kind of a clarification question for Rachel, perhaps. Um, um, I was just curious the extent to which the coalition is still working to understand the differences observed in the Hunt article. And it sounded as if the focus is on time, uh, time to treatment delays. But I was curious whether um, we've been able to look at matched cohort comparisons of treatment plans and adherence to treatment plans and outcomes um, in that setting, um, or, or, or whether that works complete, or, or, or our data suggests so strongly that it's really the time to treatment delay that, that bears the, the primary focus of the group. Well, it's really hard to get at that answer, unfortunately. Um, you know, the the registry gives you some sense of information on a treatment yes, no. There's not a lot of information on adherence. In fact, there's really no information on adherence. This is the huge limitation of using registry-based or database uh, work to try to answer these questions. I think through the TRIP award, there's going to be some spin-offs um, looking at adherence that Erica Warner received funding for, and I think she's on this call. And we hope that through the TRIP project, it will be a foundation to do more, but I think Aside from looking in an institutional medical record based project, which is limited, it's really difficult to get that data at, with the granularity. Um, de the delays are definitely there. They're certainly contributing, particularly in the higher risk breast cancers. We know that delays really do matter. Um, and unfortunately, uh, minority patients are disproportionately affected by those types of cancers. So I think delay is a, is a huge part of it, but there are data also to suggest the adherence differences over time. It's not just about that first treatment, it's about the overall treatment over time. There are so many factors at play here. And so we're trying to address 
all of them, um, but you know, step by step in different ways and in different angles and trying to figure out how we can do it. But getting that data that we all want is really difficult um, and is gonna take some real work and collaboration and data sharing. Mm -hmm. it, it might be happy to talk to you about it. I, we might have some ideas that um, we could talk through. That would be great. And I, I mean, I think the, the all payer claims database linking with registry data is a powerful new tool. I think it's hard to get access to all of that. But, um, you know, we have people on the committee who will have access to that. And I think there are going to be some things we can do. It still won't allow you to get adherence in the right way. But there are things through the claims linkage that we can do, um, I think. And that was actually a part of a project being led um, by Johnny Anian and Nancy Keating, along with the tumor registry, um, which I hope will, uh, not just for breast cancer, but across cancers to look at care. Yeah, great. Mike, were you speaking in your role as Chief Medical Officer at, at Flatiron that there might be ways to collaborate? Yeah, that was what I was uh, sort of uh, thinking about, is that maybe uh, some of our either expertise or access to data at Flatiron might be something that uh, we'd want to talk about with the coalition. Great. That would be very exciting for us. So Gary and Mark, how are we doing for time? Is it time to transition to is trip? It, it is. It yeah. is, yep. Okay. <laughs> So uh, if there's any more ideas generated from this discussion, as you start to listen to Tracy talk about the TRIP project, please uh, either make notes in the chat or feel free to reach out to us at bostonbcec.org, um, .org, bcec at gmail.com. And I will send that to uh, Gary and Mark to circulate. Thanks very much, and I'm going to pass the baton to Tracy Battaglia. Tracy? Thank you, Sharon. Shameless plug there. So I just wanna, first of all, the, the questions and the conversation is really um, exciting to hear because I think that the comments that we've heard so far really relate to some of the challenges that we're gonna speak with you about. So I hope, I hope everyone's able to stay on to continue the conversation because all the comments suggest, you know, going back to that layered, the context of the layered healthcare system that you know, no one intervention is going to fix this, and it is complicated and complex, um, and we need to come at this from multiple different angles. And so challenges with data, challenges sustaining navigators in the field and paying for them, um, and challenges, um, you know, with the, with the science um, are, are, you know, preventing us from getting to where we need to be. And so I, I think you'll, what you're going to hear next really will resonate with the questions we've heard so far. Before I, 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 launch into sort of TRIP and the research project itself. I want to acknowledge that the BBEC, Boston Breast Cancer Equity Coalition, is a fully volunteer organization. And the people that sort of have been putting their heart and soul into this are volunteering their time to do the work. Um, and so um, I think we need to keep that in mind that grassroots organizations like this are necessary but not sustainable. And we also have to be thinking about how do we support them and sustain them into the future. So with that, I'm gonna tell you about TRIP, Translating Research into Practice. So the uh, Equity Coalition formed, um, and um, as you heard, really sort of honed in on a problem within the city, really an embarrassment of riches that we were in the city with this great access to care, but yet there's this sort of persistent widening of disparities. Well, there's improvements in mortality, the gap between blacks and whites, and insured and uninsured or um, publicly insured and privately insured patients continues to grow. Um, and it was about that time that we recognized that, that many people seated at the table were affiliated with academic institutions that were part of CTSA programs, Clinical Translational Science Award programs. So Boston University, Tufts Medical Center, UMass, and Harvard all participate in NIH-funded CTSA programs, which makes us uniquely position to be eligible for funding um, for, um, from that agency. And so we collaborated and applied for funding from the National Center to Advance Translational Science at the NIH. They have a mechanism called the Collaborative Innovation Award, which requires that at least three CTSA programs collaborate on an innovation in translational science. They have a special interest, as many NIH agencies do, in disparities research. 
and community driven science. And so we decided that this was an um, opportunity to apply for funding from the National Center to Advance Translational Science. Um, and were competitive um, and awarded um, funding in 2017 for this collaborative award, uh, which is really a unique opportunity to bring together all of the um, infrastructure and resources of these academic institutions to address a really complex health issue. <clears throat> Next slide. So the TRIP project is truly a um, community engaged project about addressing disparities together. As I mentioned, it's a multiple PI project. Um, I lead the project at Boston University and Boston Medical Center. Um, Karen Freund um, at Tufts Medical Center, Jennifer Haas at The Catalyst, now at MGH, and Stephanie Lemon at UMass brings us expertise in implementation science. But this is, um, this project is dependent on our collaboration with key stakeholders. Um, Karen Burns White leads the Boston Patient Navigator Network. Um, the Patient Navigator Network in Boston has been meeting for many years, brings together um, community health workers and navigators across the state who deliver care to our most vulnerable, uh, our, our patients with the most vulnerabilities. And um, they have been key advisors to us throughout the project. You already heard about the Boston Breast Cancer Equity Coalition and all of the stakeholders there who really were the drivers to the science and asked the question and raised the question that we, we posed to answer with the study. And then we have a clinical advisory panel. Many of our clinical advisors are on this call. I saw Bev Moy's name on here. I'm sure Naomi and, and um, others are on the call. Forgive me, I can't see everybody all at once. Um, but our clinical advisors are surgical and medical oncologists, um, nurses um, and navigators who meet with us monthly to advise us on the science um, and implementation of the study. And then in the spirit of um, dissemination, um, we have colleagues in the Chicago CTSA networks who have very similar disparities and very similar academic sort of infrastructure. And they're working closely with us on our steering committee so that we can take lessons learned from TRIP and translate them into opportunities in Chicago, which shares similar disparities to Boston. Next slide. So what is the, the problem we're trying to address with TRIP? Well, the research gap tells us that there are actually evidence-based strategies for coordinating breast cancer care delivery, but they're not systematically implemented within or across hospitals. And so at the heart of them is patient navigation services. We've already heard a little bit about this. Um, I have had the pleasure of sort of dedicating a lot of my career to really understanding the impact of a health services intervention like patient navigation and its impact it can have on cancer care delivery. The American Cancer Society has really sort of been foundational in supporting navigation services. And so navigation services that are really individualized services that target um, um, patients who are at risk for poor outcomes and really targeting and understanding their individual barriers to care and trying to address them so that they can access services and achieve timely and quality care. Um, the heart of navigation is really, it is a multi-level intervention is it at, because it intervenes at the patient level, the provider level, and coordinating services at the health system level. But navigation can't be successful without specific tools, tools that have also been proven to uh, um, address disparities. Um, identifying patients who are at risk and tracking them over time requires a registry to be able to do that efficiently and effectively. Um, and while um, tracking systems may exist within hospitals, they do not exist across hospitals. And so the innovation for TRIP was to um, standardize navigation across the institutions and utilize a patient registry to help share and identify patients at risk, especially if they transfer services from hospital to hospital. But at the heart of navigation is also identifying barriers to care and systematically identifying and understanding barriers to care as they relate to the social determinants of health is increasingly recognized as necessary to care for our patient populations. There's been many of the people on this phone have been leaders in this field um, and really understanding how to do this effectively and how to connect with community resources 
to overcome some of these barriers. So systematic screening and referral for interpersonal barriers to care is another component of the TRIP intervention. So there's really an integrated intervention of these sort of three components. Next slide. So the research question is really a pragmatic question of, can we systematically implement evidence-based coordination of care across the city of Boston to reduce delays in treatment and ultimately reduce disparities in outcomes? This is a collaboration across the six hospitals listed on this slide, Brigham and Women's Faulkner Hospital, Beth Israel Deaconess, Boston Medical Center, Mass General, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and Tufts Medical Center. Next slide. So as I said, this is truly a community-engaged implementation science study. We're integrating evidence-based interventions in partnership with key stakeholders. It is a scientifically rigorous study. It's a randomized cluster step wedge study design, which is an increasingly utilized pragmatic clinical trial that allows us to roll out the study iteratively in real life practice settings, but also addresses the large intercluster variability across the different institutions. And then it is also a type one hybrid clinical effectiveness implementation trial. What that means is our mixed methods of um, the process of the intervention is secondary, um, is a secondary assess assessment to the primary clinical outcome. So we're going to be looking at clinical outcomes of time to initiation of treatment. And we have a number of secondary outcomes of quality treatment. In other words, um, completion of quality care or adherence to care as we talked about earlier. Um, so we're powered on the clinical outcome to find an effect, but and at the same time, we're going to be looking at implementation outcomes, including acceptability, adoption, fidelity to the protocol, sustainability of the protocol, and cost. Um, so regardless of our outcomes, whether we find an effect or we don't find an effect, we'll have some context to understand our findings through this implementation data. Next slide. So who is our target population? This is our eligibility criteria. And I put this, you know, um, pretty familiar picture of sort of equity versus equality to recognize that interventions like patient navigation, if they are implemented across the board, we will perpetuate disparities and not address them. And so um, navigation services need to be targeted to the populations who are most vulnerable or most at risk for poor outcomes. And so our study is designed to address the data that we shared earlier that in the Massachusetts Cancer Registry that showed us that the populations who are most likely to have delays in treatment in Massachusetts and in Boston are women who um, have um, the risk factors listed on this slide. So they're either black or Hispanic, non-English speaking as their preferred language, or on uh, um, public insurance. So you, in order to be eligible for the TRIP intervention, you need to have a new diagnosis of breast cancer, have a residence within 25 miles of Boston, and have one or more of the risk factors for delays in care. Next slide. So we implemented TRIP as a standard of care across the six hospitals. Um, and we stepped, um, as the stepped wedge design it lays out, every three months in a randomized fashion on, into one of the hospitals. We've now um, implemented the study across all the six hospitals. Um, and we are um, fully um, enrolling across all the hospitals now. I mentioned that we, this is a standard of care across the hospitals. So um, we have a waiver of informed consent because this low risk standardized navigation protocol um, is in place for all patients who come into the hospitals um, now, um, moving forward. So our current enrollment to date, I think as of September 1st, we have a total of 194 women on study. Um, you can see here the race, ethnicity, preferred language and insurance status um, of the population um, consistent with our enrollment criteria. We have mostly non-white women enrolled, half of them are black, 14% Asian, 16% other, 50% um, are, uh, I'm sorry, 25% are Hispanic. And then I think it's important to note while the majority of the patients are on, medic, are on public insurance, over half on Medicaid, we still have 30% of women who are in, ha, do have private insurance. 
which really acknowledges sort of the working population um, who's at risk. Next slide. This is just a snapshot of the social needs assessments that we're doing. A standardized component of the protocol is that every woman at their time of diagnosis um, gets a, a systematic social needs assessment completed by the patient navigator. And I want to bring your attention to the bottom row of this table that recognizes that 20% of the 194 women have a missing assessment, meaning that even in the best of circumstances with a standardized protocol with trained navigators, we're still not able to systematically complete the social needs assessment. Our qualitative data sheds light on many reasons that behind that, I'm happy to talk more about that as we move forward. But I think we can't understand the challenges and barriers if we don't assess for them. But when we do, we see about 37% have no needs reported at baseline, about 10% have one, 30% have two or more, and 4% 4, and 4 don't complete the assessment fully. When we do identified needs, the majority of them are around food insecurity, employment challenges, and challenges with utilities. Next slide. So what is our progress to date? We have completed our formative assessments which informed the design of the integrated intervention. As I mentioned, we have a standardized navigation protocol across the hospitals. Um, we have um, uh, developed a shared patient registry system using REDCAP platform, which we'll hear more about in a few minutes. Um, and we have a shared platform called Aunt Bertha that allows for systematic social needs assessment and referrals to existing agencies within the uh, platform. Uh, we stepped the intervention across the six hospitals in Boston. We've used multiple implementation strategies to do so. I mentioned our clinical advisory panel. We have regular monitoring and feedback that goes out weekly to um, each of the sites. We provide technical assistance in real time to support the navigators in the field. And we have a navigator learning collaborative um, that we bring the navigators together to learn from one another. We've completed implementation data from, uh, from three of the six hospitals. We do interviews one, um, with key informants. We do field observations of the navigators and we do surveys to assess their time um, spent in navigation activities so that we can estimate costs in the future. Next slide. So I'm going to pause there before we launch into sort of the challenges because there are many and there's lots to talk about. But I think we just wanted to make sure we had the opportunity to engage with questions around the study design itself or anything around the study that we can sort of help clarify. I think you were very clear. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay. All right, we can launch into the discussion then. If you go to the next slide. So I just want to um, go back to sort of this um, slide from, it's actually from the NCI, which is really the layered context of the layered healthcare system, recognizing that the challenges to achieving equity are not new. The lessons that we're learning from TRIP are well known challenges. Um, and I think it's fair to sort of summarize them into sort of these three different areas. One is really challenges around health systems and practice barriers. Um, this is really at the organization and practice level, but also at the provider and team level. Um, the second is around data sharing and technical challenges. Again, this is at the organizational level, but also at the, the sort of policy level locally and nationally. And then finally is, is identifying and addressing social needs, which is really as, at the heart of the individual, but also at the community. And I really appreciate Thea's comment earlier around um, the fact that we can't just um, ex expect that the individuals have the solutions and that we really need to be addressing the problem at the root cause, which really starts at the community level. Next slide. So for the next um, hour, um, together, our format was going to be to sort of launch through um, just a very high summary of the challenges in those three areas and then engage in a discussion around them. So I'm going to get us started with the health systems challenges and just share a couple of um, other points of the lessons we've learned from TRIP. So 
what we have learned will not sound unfamiliar to all of you, but that um, each of these hospitals and health systems have fragmented oncology care delivery programs, both within the institution and across the institution. Um, despite having enthusiastic and passionate partners and clinical advisors from each of the sites, there continues to be resistance to change to existing workflows. Um, we've heard about patient navigation um, in the, um, and the sustainability of patient navigators. We've heard um, um, even Manny sort of mentioned, I'm not sure where navigation lives right now in East Boston. And I think that's not an uncommon issue at institutions is sort of where does patient navigation as a healthcare delivery program sit? Um, and it often is siloed in different departments um, and not consistent with sort of the, the, um, the principle of navigation as a process and not a person. Um, there's a lack of sustainable funding for navigators, which goes beyond the health system challenge. Um, numerous information systems that don't talk to one another. And then of course, COVID-19 disruptions, as if we didn't have enough challenges. Next slide. So this was a, a figure that um, is part of our formative work. We did workflow assessments through um, key informant interviews and site visits to understand the sort of state of patient navigation at each of the hospitals. To be part, a partner in this study, each of the, par, each of the health systems um, had to have a patient navigation systems in place. And so you could see, and I'm not going to tell you which hospital is which, but at baseline, when we started this study, this is what the navigation process looked like across the, diff the six hospitals. And so I don't think we need to go into details, but I want to acknowledge that from screening to diagnosis and through treatment, through the cancer care continuum for a patient's journey to be successful, the science tells us that navigation um, services across that cancer continuum is necessary to get them through their, their care. And so if navigation exists, like in site one, in surgical oncology, but not radiology, medical oncology, or radiation oncology, how might we successfully serve that patient to get to their best outcomes? There's also a difference in lay versus professional navigators, nurse or social worker navigators, um, sometimes they are coordinated and collaborate with one another and do handoffs. Sometimes they don't communicate or work together. And so what we found at baseline was that navigation is a series of gaps. And so together with the clinical advisory panel, we developed a protocol for navigation across the hospital, across the institutions. Next slide. And so this slide is just um, meant to sort of depict the impact um, that COVID-19 has had on cancer care. I think everyone on this call is well aware um, of the impact um, on cancer care delivery. This is data from our colleague, um, Jennifer Haas's group, um, Prosper, that just, I mean, you don't have to look at the fine print to see that this is for cancer screening, for all cancer screenings, colorectal, lung, um, cervical and breast where it just completely dropped off um, at the time, you know, the COVID pandemic started. Um, I don't have data to share with you around cancer treatment, but you can imagine the same impact. Next slide. Um, the impact on navigation that we uh, observed through, from our work with our navigators, but also through a specific focus group identified that several navigators in the TRIP study were fur furloughed. Some were not furloughed, but moved from in the clinic to offsite, and several were redeployed to do COVID-19 related duties that were not outside of their usual navigation scope. Um, learning and coordinating telehealth was challenging, and, as was teaching patients to use the technology, and this was a real focus of the navigators in the field. Patients are fearful of coming into appointments. They're feeling unsure and unsafe around COVID-19 and the navigators are spending a lot of time educating patients around that issue. And then other patients are experiencing loneliness and increased psychosocial needs around this time. Next slide. So that's just sort of a very high level of the challenges that we're having from a health systems level. Um, and so we wanted to pause here and open it up for discussion around um, these issues and really ask, you know, what challenges that we've encountered resonate with you in terms of this fragmentation in care, 
sustainable models to support navigation programs or other non reimbursable services. How can we leverage COVID inspired collaboration across health systems to continue this work? Um, and, and what can we do together to sort of address this? So I'll stop there. I see there is one comment from uh, Catherine Dallow in the chat. Um, Catherine, would you like to come off mute and elaborate a little bit or? Yeah, um, I just, you know, it's more of a, um, and I, I welcome Mike and, and Paul's input, um, or even Manny or others um, who are involved with the insurance side, um, that, you know, we talk often too about the dynamic between navigation or even care management or other things from the insurance side. Um, you know, we offer care management programs, we've got member and provider service um, folks, as, as all of us do. Um, there's one thing navigating the actual treatment and appointments and what do you do in what order and, you know, other services and things, and they may or may not use our services for that. Um, they may use the provider services where those navigators exist, but um, combined with that are the nuances around um, you know, all the bills and co-payments and co-insurance and benefits and um, formularies and, and all of those things that, um, you know, to have a, a layer in there around uh, insurance navigation along the cancer journey, I think it's just something to consider. I don't, you know, we're, we're sort of talking about these things too, um, so I don't have a, a silver bullet, but I, you know, I welcome uh, Paul and others commenting on that angle. Uh, hi, this is Paul. Um, Paul, we're having trouble hearing you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, on mute. Paul, you just went on mute. I'm trying to make this challenging as possible here. <laughs> there you go. Is that better? Yeah. That is better. That's great. <clears throat> I was going to say, I think one of the challenges we get into, I think this goes back a little bit to what Dr. Jones was talking about earlier, um, is some of the issues in the society that really at the barrier to access to service. And a lot of the health system challenges are definitely based on the coordinate care, the way that all But the question around the equity issue, I think, really gets back to addressing underlying uh, determinants. In, in some of our businesses that we see, particularly in the Medicaid space, um, sometimes the reason people can't get their services is that the services are not being provided in a way that they can access. So if, you know, procedures or services are available, let's just simplify your thing, nine to five, and I'm working two jobs, and I've got two kids at home. I can't get Paul, Paul, people are unable to hear you very well. I, I can hear you a little bit, but it's a, a strain. It sounds like a number are commenting they can't hear you at all. Okay, I, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, now you're really good. Go ahead. You're good now. Um, okay. My, I guess my point behind all this is that um, okay. there's a lot of health system issues that we need to address. It's not working? No, it, fade, it fades away once you start. I'll let somebody else talk, see if I can get on some headsets here. All right. Or um, Manny, Manny has been uh, waiting a while. Manny? Uh, and yeah, and sure. also Michael Stern. Get headsets on, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, I see great presentation again. Um, any thoughts around um, value-based care? And I appreciate Catherine's um, comments around uh, the navigation. So I'll just echo that I agree that the navigation uh, for insurance and payment um, becomes very challenging. So um, adding that layer would be important. Um, but I would like to also add the fact that many of us um, are trying to both public and private perform in these value-based contracts. Um, and that is clearly a disruption on many fronts. A, number one, redeploying um, some of the staff to that work, um, you know, to try to perform on these contracts. And number two is just the distraction, if you would, um, that that may bring to this process. 
Yeah, I think that, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. It's a lot better, hopefully? Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I just, just to finish my comment, and I, I, I guess all I was trying to pick up with, and I'm going back a little bit to what Dr. James had talked about earlier, and that is, is that there's a lot of health system disparities that we clearly need to address, but there's systemic disparities within society that actually drive a lot of the dilemma here, and understanding how individuals who do experience disparity access the system is important. And whether that's through uh, health centers, whether it's understanding that, frankly, they don't, people, some people don't have time to be off Monday through Friday, nine to five, uh, and services are not available at nights, they're not available on weekends. Um, you know, we talked about food. Interestingly, housing did not show up here on any of the disparities. I think we need to be thinking more broadly uh, in the sense of the problems we're trying to solve, understanding that this kind of a group probably needs to be very specific in what we try to target and looking at one or two items that we maybe can do something different about. So I guess that was just my talking point. Michael? Yeah. Um, hi, Michael Sherman from Harvard Pilgrim. I, um, a great discussion, thank you. I was reading this, um, and I guess my comments are similar to Catherine's, but I was looking at, uh, you know, and thinking about the challenges, and a lot of it, I think, is a result of fragmentation. I'm also trying to understand what we're trying to solve for. In other words, where in the process are the breakdowns, and therefore, how do you put in, um, you know, processes that make up for that? And, you know, so to, to the extent that health plans, for example, have navigators um, or care managers, well, that's great. Uh, and, you know, we are doing a lot, for example, exchanging care plans with some of the institutions, but that doesn't help people who don't know how to get in for screening or have transportation issues or others back, back at the front end. And it seems to me that um, there's an opportunity for a broader navigation program, but one that doesn't live within a health plan, one that doesn't live within a payer, but one that is broadly um, available where the people are trained, the individuals are trained who work there um, either to direct people to an institution or to help them solve their problems, whether it is lack of transportation, not understanding insurance, not understanding other aspects of access. Uh, it also seems that uh, there may be the opportunity to create some broader information flows to various systems to help them do a better job of understanding things such as who's a network for them or, or who to refer them to. And, uh, you know, final brief comment, it seems that if this is something that is, um, that goes across the healthcare ecosystem, that it's probably not something that one, any one of us would do ourselves because it would not be successful, but it's one where we would need to probably contribute some funding and maybe resources and, and have some sort of central entity, um, perhaps sponsored, that may not be the right word, by the ACS um, that can help, you know, stand this up and, and create that. Thank you for those comments. I want to, um, I just want to comment, respond to two things. One is that the notion of this, of a navigation network like this living outside of the healthcare system. I mentioned our colleagues in Chicago um, and um, Anne-Marie Murphy, who's um, at Rush in, in Chicago, leads um, a coalition in, in Chicago that used to be called the um, Chicago um, Equal Hope. Oh. It's called Equal Hope now. It used to be called the Metropolitan Breast Cancer Coalition, I think. Um, and they were um, a grassroots organization. Um, they were actually quite well funded for many years through, um, I think, the Komen Foundation. Um, they may have also had resources from the American Cancer Society. They're a really um, integral organization in Chicago that focuses on uh, women who have really um, um, serious vulnerabilities around breast and cervical cancer screening and treatment. And they actually have their own infrastructure of navigation systems, really more community health workers because they're not really integrated into the health system, but they work across health systems. Of course, that program has been successful. They've actually adopted some of our tools that TRIP, trip created, including our um, systematic screen for social needs. And she's actually shared some of that data with us, which is really quite quite fascinating to see. Um, but a model like that is sort of something um, akin to, I think, Michael, what you're talking about. But paying for it and sustaining it 
is the challenge, right? And so then getting back to Manny's comment about sort of value-based care, you know, how can we get institutions to sort of invest in a program that supports some of their patients, you know, through their value-based payments, perhaps? I think we have to be creative and innovative in creating systems that live outside the health system. And that's way beyond my expertise and pay grade. <laughs> but that's why we're having this conversation with all of you today. Tracy? Yeah, okay. we, we've, and, and it's Michael, and we, you know, we've done some interesting things around value-based payment, but it, you know, cracking that for oncology has proved challenging, at least in, in our market. So um, I, I won't try to solve that here, but you know, if others at the table want to come together and uh, propose something, we would love to be in that discussion to see if there's something that works. Um, you know, and, and that, that, that's challenging for many reasons, but in, in this context, again, one of them is that for those who are, are not in a provider system who are, who, where there are failures at the front end, it's tough to know who's on the other side of that agreement. But uh, I, I, I would certainly agree that for defined populations that, that there are opportunities. So, um, you know, again, have, happy to try to move something forward there if there is sufficient interest in the broader group. Tracy. This is Karen Freud. I just wanted to add to what Michael and Catherine and Paul had mentioned that the data really shows that care coordination programs and navigation programs work best when they are coordinated within the provider system. Um, and those have been, um, um, of the, all the evidence-based programs that work, those are the ones that have worked. So I think it really does speak to the need for this to span the providers, um, the provider systems and not to be um, um, payer-based. As you mentioned, Tracy, that is a question out of ignorance, really. But um, you know, I think it's clear that that patient navigation it leads to improved outcomes. Uh, but since so much is driven by return on investment, are, are, have there been studies on the cost effective cost effectiveness of navigation, and can a financial argument be made for for uh, health systems and payers investing in, 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 you know, standardizing and professionalizing and uh, uh, coordinating navigation? Yeah, so there's, there's been research in this area, Mark, but I think from a cost effectiveness perspective, you know, you're bringing people into care, right? By definition, what you're doing is bringing more people into care. And so I don't think the studies to date have been designed sort of on a long term enough basis to demonstrate like reduction in stage or reduction in mortality, which is really the long term effect that you're going to see a return on your investment. Um, I'm not a cost person, but um, our study is going to be looking at um, micro costing, which is basically just from a health systems perspective, what does it cost to do this. Um, Karen um, Freund maybe can speak to this because she's leading um, the National Navigation Roundtable Policy Group that's sort of thinking and looking at um, additional um, ways to pay for navigation and um, thinking about sort of return on investment sort of models to help institutions and, and programs to sort of demonstrate the value and the worth. I think the major way you do that is by reducing uh, hospitalizations, ER visits, and no-show rates. I think that's essentially you know, the, the, the way to do that from a, a health system perspective. But Karen, you may have something to add. Yeah, I mean, there, there's sort of two ways you can look at it from the institutional point of view, beyond the cost effectiveness point of view. And we sort of still are you know, straddling this fee for service versus, versus uh, a population management um, and, uh, and quality based payment models. But certainly there's, there's very good evidence that patient navigation reduces total medical expenditures. Um, and that's the work from, um, from the group in Alabama. Um, and that's using lay navigators. That's not even using nurses. Um, but there's also some fairly good return on investment data for individual health systems, um, just in terms of maintaining patients within their system. So I think from both strategies, you can look at the, at the, um, the uh, economic model for an institution to invest in navigators. I know we're starting to run over and we're, we have to, I don't want to shortchange the, the next two discussions, but I, I think if I could just ask something that I think is going to really span these three uh, distinct discussions, and that is, uh, it, it seems so much depends on collaboration and coordination uh, between uh, and across uh, health systems in, in the city. Um, and the question has been asked by the group shown on this slide, can we leverage our COVID-inspired collaboration? 
uh, to, to go beyond COVID and to, and, and to focus on, for example, uh, breast cancer outcomes. Um, I think the, between the council members and the invited guests, we have people from all six of the institutions uh, where this study is being done who are in leadership positions who can either directly or through their influence um, help address some of these challenges and improve coordination. I know we're not going to solve all of these issues today at this meeting uh, in the remaining time, but I hope this will lead to some follow-up uh, conversations, meetings, collaborations to really try to help this group get better collaboration and then all, and ideally help find ways to sustain the funding. But um, I don't want to yet put any of you direct by, directly on the spot by calling on you, but does anybody want to volunteer ways in which you, from what you've heard, you can see how you might be able to uh, help? Would a follow-up meeting to, um, with senior representatives uh, from each of these uh, hospitals be of value? And, and which department within the hospitals would be the, the most value? Maybe ask the, the uh, Tracy and your team. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're focused on breast cancer specifically, um, you know, you need to have all the disciplines in place. I think each institution has its own structure of how the programs are, are you know, are structured and function and organized. And so I think the leadership will probably differ from institution to institution, but I think clearly, um, a shared vision for the role that navigation can play within an oncology program is critical. And as Karen mentioned and others have mentioned, there's science that shows best practices for navigation. Um, and everyone likes to have a navigator and advertise that they have a navigator. It's a feel good program and patients have come to expect it. Um, but when you implement navigation in a siloed way and you don't offer it across the continuum of care and it's not coordinated, um, it doesn't support the patient and improve outcomes. And so we need to have, because of the, the, the way that navigators are funded through grants and philanthropy and, you know, sometimes institutional funds, it's usually within a department, medical oncology or surgical oncology or radiology, as opposed to across the cancer program. And so it needs to come at the level of the cancer center, depending on sort of what that leadership looks like. Wouldn't the screening even be before the cancer center? Like, yeah, but presumably, you know, they're part of the cancer center, hopefully. Any other comments before we move on to the next session? Mark, I think there would for sure be interest in this kind of thing. I'm just, you know, from speaking from B.I. Uh, Leahy that uh, this is definitely a, a high value for the patients and I think as Tracy was just saying, integrating this across the larger sort of framework of the city and of the state makes it feel like it's a expectation. It helps us also navigate with our administrative leadership. So I think that that's, that would be a very helpful change. Great. Thanks, David. Hey, Mark, it's Alice Pomponio. Hi, Alice. Hey, can you hear me? <clears throat> Yep. So, um, hi everyone. Alice Pomponio. I'm uh, a, a volunteer with ACS, but I also serve on MIT's faculty for healthcare ventures and Catalyst. And I'm curious for the group um, what your thoughts are in terms of patient-facing um, digital tools to support navigation. Whether that could be, you know, a, a, an opportunity to open sort of pan system, pan payer, because uh, currently the way that some of these navigation tools are developed are still very much housed within departments, hospitals, payers. And even if it were a sort of portfolio of tools that all allowed some level of communication, but really 
focused around what the patient journey would look like moving between and across networks, whether, you know, closer um, coordination with the technology development and some of the companies that are starting up, which are doing so almost in complete isolation of the public health agenda would be helpful. And if that's the case, I would be happy to bring in the MIT community, especially the innovation initiative that's focused on impact innovation. Perfect segue to the next set of discussions. So thank you for that comment. Thank you very much, Alice. If we could go to the next slide, I will then start um, build on this conversation as we talk about the challenges that we have um, attempted to address around this very issue of data sharing and how do we facilitate handoffs between hospitals? First of all, why do we need a regional approach to health disparities? Well, there's, first of all, there's evidence from the uh, Mass Department of Public Health that at least 50% of women of color span multiple health systems during their breast cancer uh, um, journey. And there's a number of reasons for that, including insurance instability, as well as patient preferences. But this is, um, this is a known issue. So uh, oftentimes we see this situation where individual hospitals look at the patients that are staying in their system and say, we don't see any disparities but nobody is looking at the patient who got her diagnosis at one hospital, told those physicians she was going to get a second opinion, and either never went for a second opinion or shows up at that next hospital for a second opinion 15, 18, 24 months later. And we have anecdotal evidence of this as well as the, uh, the state um, uh, registry data that shows these delays that, we are, um, that we're discussing today. Um, we need population level tracking real time, so the registry gives us a great um, snapshot of what happens, um, but that's the problem after it's too late. We can't um, be reactive and proactive based on, on the registry data. Um, and we're, we've gotten very good at documenting health disparities, but now's the time to really do something about them. Um, so as Alice just mentioned, our, pro si our providers are all siloed with our own health system, within our own health systems. And unfortunately, the technology that we currently use is not always helpful. In our formative work, we identified that most of our patient navigators within each of these systems is using three or four different software, software platforms, um, most of which provide no population management tools um, to actually track patients. Um, we found navigators that are building their own Excel spreadsheets and using their Outlook calendars to try and keep track of their, um, of their patients in real time. So we found that te the technology has actually been a hindrance as opposed to a, a help to the patients. And then, of course, we need to balance the privacy um, issues with a continuity of care. Um, and this is really getting back to our first point about why we're pushing for a system um, level across the entire city. Next slide. So for our study, we um, developed a tracking system, a real-time tracking system using the REDCap um, software platform. We decided on this one because it's free and readily available. Um, to systems as one of the tools that was developed through um, the CTSI programs. Um, and so our real question is how we can take um, this example of a technology and, de and the development of a regional wide registry that can be used for real time tracking and how can we translate this into a sustainable solution. Um, we're going to turn now to an example of how we've used this and my um, colleague Dr. Amy LeClaire is going to present the next couple of slides. Thank you, Karen. Next slide, please. So this, um, this is a good case example that we've um, come across in TRIP, and it harkens back to what Rachel Friedman talked about um, earlier this hour about the lack of communication between hospitals and how that can impede care. So in this study, in this um, case example, a patient navigator one at hospital one made, met with a patient to coordinate the patient's biopsy appointments with imaging and the breast health doctor. After the patient's DCIS diagnosis, the navigator noticed that the patient did not show up for her pre-surgical visit at their hospital. So the patient navigator learned through EPIC that the patient had other visits completed at a second hospital, and she wondered if the patient was being seen there. So the patient navigator reached out to the patient and learned that the patient was seeking a second opinion. Notice that this was only possible in this case because those two systems were both on EPIC, which isn't true across systems. Next slide, please. So in this case, our REDCAPS um, system allowed the patient navigator to message, um, to connect to a navigator two at hospital two and check in with the patient. 
REDCAP provided a direct line of communication between the navigators at the two hospitals. And the patient navigator who originally encountered the patient um, was able to ensure the patient received a handoff and a transfer of her care to the second hospital. In another incident instance, um, a navigator at the second hospital would be able to log into our REDCAP system and see that their patient that they had just encountered had already received care, had started care for breast cancer treatment at another hospital. And so those are two ways in which the system that we've currently developed is helping, but is by far um, not, it is not a perfect solution by far. Next slide. So looking at these examples and building on our previous discussion, you know, we're wondering whether these challenges that we've encountered resonate with what you're seeing, um, both at the hospital um, as well as the payer level levels. Um, what changes can our institutions implement and, and um, how can you help to facilitate this data sharing so we can improve care coordination? Can REDCap be integrated into the existing hospital EMRs so that it, there's less, uh, you know, so it's, it goes more smoothly? Not easily. Um, that is a major barrier: is the lack of interoperability between, um, you know, other in, under other standalone platforms and the different EHRs that the different hospitals have. I mean, because it seems like. Where, where you're not going to get the hospitals to change their entire, entire EMR. So is there a possibility of, of modifying or developing a system that can be integrated across the systems to facilitate, you know, the coordination? It was pretty clear, Mark, when we started this research project that that was going to be beyond the scope of us to be able to facilitate. But I think your, your, your question is, the exact question, how can we use this experience? And is there a way that we can, we can develop something that would allow for that coordination within the systems that people are using on a daily basis, as opposed to building a workaround? I'll also share that <clears throat> our experience with the navigators utilizing this REDCap um, system has been mixed. Um, it was designed with them. Basically, we went to each of the sites and said, what systems are you using and what fields are necessary for, for your workflow? We'll build you a program to help support you. Um, and as I mentioned in that slide where I showed the sort of variation in navigation, there was variation in what the, what the navigators were using at the sites. Um, Karen mentioned Outlook calendars and Excel files, but there were also people using sticky notes, um, you know, on their computers. And so we built a program with their feedback and customized it um, to their needs. And while they use it, they, they very often revert back to their existing systems. And um, I think the challenge in that comes from um, you know, that the institutions don't have a standard of, you know, use of programs like this and allow, allow the staff and the, and the providers to sort of create their own systems instead of sort of, you know, having standardized systems that are expected and utilized across programs. Um, so even though we have this REDCap system and they do use it for the basic elements, it's not utilized to its full potential because they continue to rely on their Excel files and other programs which aren't integrated into the EMR either. Tracy, this is Manny. Um, our experience in this area is that um, if it doesn't live in Epic, it becomes really challenging uh, to get people to use other systems. Or like you said, they use other systems like Outlook and Excel. Um, I believe all but two organizations in the research um, have Epic. And um, have we looked at the, the value of Epic Care Everywhere um, providing that integration? And has that helped in terms of the, the care navigation, number one? The second question, it goes back to where this conversation started around uh, navigation beginning at the community level. Um, and 
I'm, I'm still challenged by, you know, every time I hear about navigation at the payer level or at the hospital system level, you know, we've seen this before and we've tried these before and it really hasn't worked that well. And I'm not saying this because um, I'm at the community level, but I think we've seen true success and I'll go back to value-based care, whether it's the Medicaid ACO that um, at least for some of us is at the community level or um, programs that we're running like our asthma program where um, back to Thea's point that it goes beyond sometimes just making the medical appointments. It's, it's some other things that are driving um, adherence to care or compliance and it's housing, it's food, it's transportation and a whole host of issues. Uh, the challenge there is scalability. Um, you know, when we look at our asthma program, we have, you know, a number of people working for a small number of patients, but they're dealing with some of those challenging issues that are preventing folks just from um, taking um, or having their kids take the medications that they need or working with the landlords um, and things like that. So, um, so I, I said a lot there, two questions, the epic question, and then whether or not, again, what's, has there been studies showing navigation at the community level is more effective than having navigations at the hospital system level or the uh, payer level. Karen, do you want Great, to take the Yeah. I'll jump in on a couple of issues. So Manny, um, I think your point's a good one. The, the challenge is building a, a solution that only, that requires that every primary care provider, every community group as well as every hospital beyond EPIC isn't a great solution unless we can think of how we span the various, um, various electronic records. Um, you know, as a primary care provider, I think that, that the kinds of conditions primary care doctors take care of, um, that navigation care coordination for things such as asthma work really well at the community level. The challenge with breast cancer care, as we know, as primary care doctors, once that patient starts into their breast cancer care, they oftentimes don't even contact their primary care provider for the next 12 to 18 months. You know, all of their care is really focused at the uh, oncology level. And I think that's why, you know, for this particular instance and this of, of care, that, that oftentimes the hospital system level care for breast cancer may be a more effective one. Mm -hmm. And just to build on that point, you know, when, when patients, you know, to have the model of Chicago is really appealing, but you have to make sure that those navigators are able to integrate into all of those health systems because the way that you navigate in one is gonna be different than you navigate in another. And the needs in that center are gonna to differ too. You know, For example, at Dana-Farber, we have resource specialists, so we have social workers, and what they do is sometimes overlapping with what navigation is doing on its own in another center. So. You know, you really, this is the complexity of it, even in our small city, is just, you know, tailoring it even um, for Boston requires in, an individualized approach. And I think in a system, you're able to get that person comfortable and really provide the navigation needed for that system, um, which is different than the navigation needed to support that patient in her resources or, or whatever she may need to get to those uh, evaluations and appointments. I, I think uh, one other aside is I think, you know, several years ago, there was a lot of focus on the mass information highway as a way of creating information exchange between institutions. And, and that really, the timeline for that and the capacity for that really seems to have been uh, stripped back for reasons that I don't understand. And, I don't know if it's because Epic has really become the dominant player in the EHR marketplace, but I think, um, you know, sort of local efforts to sort of improve interoperability and information exchange really seem uh, to, to not uh, have met the promise that we had hoped for and kind of require sort of, you know, the, a type of system like the, the system we built in REDCap, which is really pretty uh, unsophisticated. Uh, and it would, you know, one would hope that there could be a more coordinated effort. This, this is Paul. I should say, I'm not that close to it, but I would agree with the HIE issues and the challenges there. Um, one of the things to look at from the project perspective is the application of uh, HL7 and FIRE, the FAST Healthcare Interoperability Resource Requirements. 
you may find that the federal government is setting the platform for that interoperability that you're looking for between systems. So not everybody has to be on Epic, but all systems can talk to one another. Tracy, should we move on to the final section? Yeah, we absolutely should. I just want to acknowledge two comments in the chat. Um, one from uh, Rebecca Lobb talking about sort of partnering with existing patient advocate foundations um, in doing the work to, which actually I think fully addresses Alice's comment about, um, you know, patient driven navigation as opposed to community level navigation. And so certainly I think those are potential partners for us to think about for the equity coalition, Rachel and and Sharon. So thanks for that recommendation, Rebecca. But yes, let's move on to the next discussion. Thanks, Karen and um, Amy. All right, thanks. So I think uh, we're the closers here. Uh, so the third pillar of our program is being able to systematically identify and address uh, social needs. Uh, and I think uh, we'll provide a basic overview of this, but it would be nice to hear your thoughts about um, experiences for systems addressing health-related um, social needs. Uh, I know that Thea and others are involved in a Boston-wide uh, collaboration that is doing uh, some of this work as well. Um, next slide, please. So um, I'd like to pass things off to Dr. Cheryl Clark from the Brigham, who is collaborating with us on this effort. Cheryl, do you want to present our data? Do we have Cheryl? Um, all right, well, I can present the data. If I don't know if Cheryl, you're on mute, um, but. Um, I, don't, I don't see her at the moment. Okay, all right, so maybe she got called away. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is a slide that you saw earlier um, that, that Tracy alluded to, and it is uh, sort of the summary of the uh, assessments that we've done on the first 194 uh, patients that were enrolled in TRIP. Uh, and as you can see, um, very substantial social needs identified. Uh, you know, I think 40% uh, of the sample identified uh, one or more needs. But I think the other piece of it is that, um, you know, despite uh, really rigorous efforts to try and get systematic screening done as part of this program. Uh, uh, yeah. so, uh, look Jennifer, Cheryl is here now. Okay, Cheryl, take it away. And I'm apologize. I don't know why we're having such difficulty with audio on this, but can folks hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think, you know, Jennifer, um, just to um, pick up where you left off, I'm Cheryl Clark. I'm a hospitalist at Brigham and a social epidemiologist. And, you know, so we sort of look at uh, health related social needs. They're a subset, right, of these broader issues around social determinants of health. Um, as we sort of looked at this, I think the point that these data make are the point that Thea uh, James at, um, at um, BMC has made that uh, these issues and really do um, precede COVID. And I think that's one of the powerful um, examples of TRIP is that um, these data and this infrastructure was, was sort of developed with this understanding. And if you, as you sort of think about, you know, what this looks like from a structural perspective, uh, both uh, prior to COVID and many of these data sort of represent that food insecurity being enormous. Um, so 22% among patients who are, are, uh, are thinking about and, and trying to, to get their breast cancer treatment, folks are also thinking about really basic things like unemployment, 21% uh, being really high. And we're seeing this um, outside of, of, of this context uh, nationally, uh, just being exacerbated during COVID. Uh, I think that we need also to be able to really put this into the context of these broader social determinants of health and an understanding that our patients are experiencing structural racism and structural inequities. And so as we think about what it looks like to manage health-related social needs in a sort of referral um, loop system, uh, we also have to think about what other partnerships we need to put in place to understand this lived experience for patients and to understand how we also want to broaden our coalition and relationships. And so I'm excited to hear that conversation. 
uh, and Jennifer will uh, give us additional points that uh, we'd like to drive the conversation. Okay, next slide, please. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, so I think these are just a few comments from our navigators about the difficulties they faced um, being able to integrate this with their workflow. Uh, so, you know, I think that um, much of it is time pressure. I think, uh, as we noted, some of these navigators work in busy oncology practice, surgical oncology practices. Uh, they're oftentimes doing uh, tasks that are sort of more around navigating the providers than navigating the patients. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think a few quotes, uh, sometimes patients don't realize what they need until they're going through more treatment and they realize, oh no, I've missed three days of work uh, and this month uh, and my job's on the line or I don't have $150 now to pay for food uh, for, for my family or whatever it is. Um, I think that because of the time pressure, navigators typically default to their usual resources. So they typically, particularly for breast cancer, have two or three places that they refer to. I, mean, I think we heard the LE Fund many, many times over. Uh, and so, you know, when at first, so the platform we're using to do social screenings is called Aunt Bertha, uh, was introduced. It was kind of difficult to get to think about just transitioning over to it. The resources I had were generally more helpful or things that I already uh, was used to. You know, but I think some of the things we um, noticed is that navigators were sometimes referring, a lot of these organizations are transient in the resources they have, they run out of resources, they shut down, they reopen again. Uh, and I think that that's more of an issue now in the you know, post COVID era than it ever was before. Uh, and we actually noted that some of the navigators were referring to resources that had actually um, temporarily shut down or had no resources at that point, which is one of the issues to um, solely relying on usual resources. Um, I think the other thing uh, is that it's hard to know that, um, that the uh, resource they're referring to is what we call close the loop um, and that the patient has actually been able to access their resource and had their needs met. I think this really uh, speaks to the need for longitudinal relationship between the navigator and the patient. I think if you think that this is sort of a one and done process, um, it really undermines uh, the goals of TRIP, which is that really uh, the hope would be that a navigator could st or a team of navigators could stick with a patient until um, their needs were resolved. So I never know on the other end whether or not they're uh, really receiving things um, and whether or not they understand what to do. So I think, uh, you know, I think uh, Cheryl uh, has often referred to this as the bridge to nowhere, uh, that you kind of send this thing off and you hope that it's okay, but without any further follow-up or discussion, um, it's hard to know what to do. Uh, and then I think really just noting that these resources, these community-based resources um, are nonprofits. Uh, they're really vulnerable. And I think, you know, as a consequence of COVID, many of these resources have closed um, or really scaled back. Next slide. Uh, so, you know, I think that we've really tried hard in, as part of TRIP to come up uh, with a uh, systematic implementation of social needs screening. So we have lots of routine interactions with the sites. Um, sites get weekly reports about the number of eligible patients, uh, the number of patients who have and have not had their social screening reported as, uh, in, in our centralized database. Uh, we now do a monthly stakehold newsletter. Uh, we have regular meetings with clinical leadership at the sites and we do regular site visits. Uh, in addition, we recently had a special session with the navigators as part of a citywide uh, navigator network uh, meeting to help uh, build uh, skills around doing social screens. I think uh, sometimes the navigators feel um, uncomfortable asking these sort of personalized questions. Uh, and I think, you know, sort of uh, help uh, building skills with the navigators around uh, how to interact with patients and make both them and uh, the patients more comfortable. Next slide, please. So I think that's what we wanted to uh, present in terms of a high level overview. And I think really want to turn uh, now uh, to opening up the discussion around doing systematic screening uh, and referral uh, for social needs. And I, I think as Cheryl pointed out, it's important to think about this um, as a more limited uh, context around healthcare, there are obviously 
um, larger social needs that would be more difficult uh, to challenge, uh, to, to tackle. And so I think, you know, do the challenges uh, we've described resonate with you? Are there other initiatives that we can partner with or leverage? Uh, and are there, um, you know, a, a couple of actions that we can commit to in terms of um, these issues? Thanks. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Jennifer, can you comment at all about sort of the citywide initiative around this? Because there was a citywide initiative around sort of systematic screening for social determinants. Yeah, I think if Thea is on the call, she might be better. She's been much more integrated. Um, do we still have Thea, James? appears to still be with us. Mute. So, you know, I think as, uh, as background, I think the uh, group initially came together around some of the uh, Medicaid ACO requirements and, uh, you know, has been meeting uh, pretty regularly over the last, I would say, two-ish years um, and is moderated by a group called Health Resources in Action. Um, and has really uh, been focused on uh, sort of trying to address uh, some of these needs. Um, Cheryl, do you have any additional comments about the group? Yeah, and I would say it's another example of uh, just folks coming together um, really around patient experience. Um, and, and it also connects, I think, to some of the points that were made earlier about value-based care and how that sort of creates uh, some opportunities for innovation. Uh, as uh, many of our institutions were sort of setting up their Medicaid uh, ACOs, uh, including uh, C3 uh, came together, um, you know, as a part of this, we all sort of wondered how uh, we as, uh, as sort of subject matter experts and individuals interested in uh, addressing social determinants of health could come together uh, and make sure that we could collect data that we could use to advocate on behalf of patients. And so we uh, used a lot of the tools that were out there um, and were able to sort of put together a series of, um, of, of buckets, really domains, uh, to help us capture things like food insecurity, transportation, and uh, worked to integrate those uh, questionnaires into our electronic medical record systems. And so you'll see a, a version of this sort of in Epic um, at Brigham at Ma and partners or Mass General Brigham and Thea can speak to the work that's been done that really sort of led the field around Thrive that has built this as a part of, um, of social care, you know, at Boston Medical Center. Uh, but it's been an interesting uh, way to see hospitals come together across systems. Uh, I think Beth Israel, Tufts, uh, Mass General Brigham, C3 and other institutions have really come together. And we continue to meet monthly uh, to share uh, our understanding to bring in partners from the city um, at various points. We've also had conversations with Mass uh, DPH around some of their uh, state level initiatives, trying to understand uh, how to address social determinants of health in their Mass Up initiative, for example. So it's it's an interesting model um, that I think we'd like to um, to leverage, and certainly have been able to leverage some of the tools from that work uh, for um, some of the social screening work we've done in this project, uh, but I also think it could be interesting to understand how um, how, how this sort of cross-sector, you know, cross-institutional uh, work uh, can also support and be supported by uh, by folks on this call. You know, we, are there any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, um, you know, I just want, in closing, I would like to get you all out on time. I, I first want to thank you all for participating. I, I really want to thank the, uh, the uh, Boston uh, Breast Cancer Equity Coalition and the TRIP group for all of their hard work. Uh, this has been a real eye-opener for me. Um, and I see both the incredible importance of this work and incredible challenges associated with it. Um, there were so many discussion points brought up. Let me try to briefly summarize a few things and, and focus on some perhaps follow-ups. Um, I think perhaps Dr. Thea James made uh, the key foundational point that, um, you know, 
we have to ID, identify and address the underlying social needs of the communities. Uh, and that, that's at the foundation, at the root cause of so, so many of our challenges. Um, the most of our day today has been focusing around uh, navigation um, as, as one way of beginning to address, uh, identify and address some of these social needs. Um, uh, standardizing navigation, training navigators, very importantly, sustainable funding for, for navigators. I think early on, um, Manny Lopes uh, uh, noted the importance of coordination between the, the federally qualified community health centers and, and the hospitals and the hospital systems. Um, um, important to keep the payers involved as well. Um, I think when we started talking about the Breast Cancer Equity Coalition and um, uh, some of the reasons because of the dis disparate outcomes in breast cancer uh, among different ethnic groups, um, there was a, a beginning of a conversation between uh, Dr. Mike Vasconcells, who's the chief medical officer at, at Flatiron, um, and uh, members of the, of the coalition um, where perhaps there can be some follow-up uh, and uh, opportunity for a collaboration to help perhaps identify what may be uh, the most important uh, causes of some of these disparate outcomes. Uh, I think once we started talking specifically about the TRIP group and their key question is can we systemically uh, implement evidence-based coordination of care across the city of Boston to reduce delays in treatment and reduce disparities. Um, it, it seemed to me to be clear that the uh, biggest challenge uh, besides cost is efficient communication and coordination of care across the different hospitals uh, and the hospital systems. Um, I, I, I think that you know, it was noted that um, technology hasn't been, uh, has been a hindrance. I, I might argue that the challenge has been that it's not technology in and of itself, it's the technologies and how they've been employed and that perhaps one thing that we can do together is to try to uh, work across systems um, with the right people in each system to better um, to, to integrate so that we don't have to go through EPIC together with Aunt Bertha, together with Red Cap in order to get the work done. That we need to perhaps by collaborating with the chief information uh, technology officers in, in each uh, hospital, figure out ways that we can truly integrate and avoid these workarounds and extra work for navigators. Uh, I was uh, I was very Pleased to hear Dr. Avigan, who just joined the council, and, and uh, the interest in, and the willingness of B.I. Leahy to um, to work uh, closely with, uh, even even more closely. I know you're very uh, aligned with the uh, the coalition and the trip group already, um, and I, I think that at least what I took away from this was that this this is a very obviously complex. So these are complex issues. We, we aren't going to solve them all today, but what I would really hope, and I will commit to playing a role in trying to uh, facilitate and encourage follow-up conversations and, and, and asking members of the council and these invited guests to use, not necessarily, you know, if it's some of the problems may not be directly under your control, but the people on this council and the invited guests are very influential people. I know a number of you I have a hard time saying no to, and I think most people have a hard time saying no to. So uh, we're gonna try to leverage that and to try to help forge the right collaboration so that we can help um, move, uh, help the, the coalition and the trip group move this incredibly important work forward. So I hope there'll be more to come. We will send out uh, a summary of this. Again, you'll have available to you the, the, um, the um, recording of this um, and we will send the slides as well. I ask you again to please fill out the, um, uh, the evaluation that will be sent to you shortly. Um, maybe I, I'll leave it to Tracy if you want to say any closing words before we sign off. 
Thanks, Mark. Yeah, just a real sort of huge and sincere thank you to you and Gary for making this discussion possible and for all the council um, advisors for their input. Um, I think we've presented a really complex challenge and um, I appreciate that um, the solutions lie within all of us and I look forward to working with all of you individually to move this work forward. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you all. And uh, I'm sorry, we're three minutes over, but uh, I appreciate your attendance. Thank you very, very much and have a good day. Be well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.